today on Finside the NFL. We'll have Dante Colinelli on. We'll discuss rookie minicamp. Who to believe the hype on, who not to. We'll also discuss which UDFAs could make the 53. Plus, we'll get his thoughts on the draft class since he was on pre-draft. We got a bunch to talk about. Please do us a favor. Smash the like button. Subscribe if you're new. Let's get into this. What is good, Finn Nation? What's good? It's your boy Reason, and we're back here for another one. I am joined once again by Dante Colinelli as a little bit of a draft follow-up, but also to discuss a little bit of these guys going to minicamp as it is this weekend. So, Dante, um, you've now had over a week to let the let let the draft sink in. You've let the dust settle. Coming away from this draft, let's start off with an easy one. Mm. Your initial takeaways from this draft, because a lot of fans wanted impact players at 21 and 55. And is where do you stand with the Dolphins going with more ceiling guys than immediate day one impact guys? Yeah, I think, um, I think it look the class in general, the way I've kind of pitched it in my own head is that it's a high risk, high reward class, right? And so what the Dolphins are saying with this group of players is is hey, we're betting on our internal development. We're 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 betting on our coaches, we're betting on our ability to scout better than other teams. Uh, in some cases, I think in players that they probably overdrafted a little bit. Um and they're, they're trying to play for the future. And I, I think that, look, I think a lot of times the draft in the NFL does kind of get pegged as this um, thing where you have to get immediate impact players. You don't have to, right? Like the draft really should be about building for the future. Um, and I think, you know, look, the Dolphins are betting on themselves. They're betting on their own internal development. And that's okay. That's not a bad strategy. I totally understand it, right? So, you know, as a, as a guy who works the national beat now, Right. So when I look at a team's draft plan, a bad draft plan to me is a plan that I don't understand. Right. Like I, I can't connect dots. Right. Like I look at Atlanta's plan. And I'm just like, dude, I like, what are we cooking here? We're not cooking anything. <laughs> uh, right. So I look at the Dolphins plan and I can sit here. I can disagree with it. I can agree with it, but it's a plan. It's a plan that makes sense. I can draw the dots from A to B to C and I can get to an end goal that makes sense. Um, now I think there are a lot of pitfalls that come with getting from A to B and B to C with some of these players. I think um, I think there's a little bit of uh, I don't want to use the word arrogance, but I oh, maybe overconfidence in some of the the players that I think they selected and in the uh, at, in the range that they selected them in. Um, but look, if it turns out they're going to look like geniuses, but there is a version of this also where there's not a single impact player from this class um, at all. There there is mm -hmm. because I think the player who's probably going to get the most immediate impact is like RB three or wide receiver four, right? Like I, that, that worries me, but also at the same time, you like a lot of what you see from guys like chop. You like a lot of what you see from Jalen, right? You like a lot of what you see from Malik Washington. So high risk, high reward. The dolphins are betting on themselves. If it works out, they're going to look like geniuses. They're going to have a lot of cheap contracts for good role players. And that's what the draft is for. So we'll see. I, I think, you know, I hate saying we have to wait and see, but I think with this class, you you just really do. So I don't I don't have necessarily a strong opinion. I think the plan makes sense. Um, how confident am I that this plan is well executed? Look, I I've been alive for 
24 years, the entire 24 years, the Dolphins have not been good at developing talent. So if they turn it around, great, I'll take it. Uh, and they've shown some signs of doing that under Mike McDaniel, right? So I, and I think that that's very encouraging. So overall, I'm happy with the class. I think the plan makes sense. Uh, I have individual gripes with the players, but it's fine. I, I think that there's a version of history that works out pretty well. We'll get into the players in a second, but let me take you out of your like scouting shoes for a second, putting you in your fandom shoes. Just from what you've seen watching what Anthony Weaver did in Baltimore and what Butch Berry has done with Austin Jackson and Liam Eikenberg, do you, you know, you said, okay, they have a plan. I understand they have a plan. Do you understand why they have the faith in the plan given the trench guys they have and their history of development and getting production out of young players? I think I have a lot more faith in Anthony Weaver than I do in Butch Berry. Um, I think one of the things that I didn't really touch this topic a lot during the season because I just didn't really feel like uh, getting crap from people about it, but I don't think the offensive line improved as much as people think it did. Um, Mm. And I think a lot of the improvements along the line were scheme based rather than individual players growing now, that's not to say that players didn't get better at all. Obviously, Liam Eikenberg got better. I think Austin Jackson got better. But um, when push came to shove, those players still were not good enough. You didn't see and, a big leap. You yeah, and the leap. reason that this team loses to good teams is because they only have one pitch on offense. There's no curveball. There's no changeup. It's a fastball every time. And the reason it's the fastball every time is because the offensive line can't block for more than 2.5 seconds. And Tua is not a quarterback who operates well under pressure. And so when you have those two factors compounded on each other and you run into Mike McDonald, who was the defensive coordinator for the Ravens with Anthony Weaver as his D-line coach last year, you run into the Steve Spagnolas and Sean McDurbins of the world and they say, hey, this team cannot pass block longer than 2.5 seconds. If we take away the first two reads, we're going to get to Tua before he gets to read three because that's just how math works. That's not a knock on Tua. That's just how it works. And so for me personally, I was hoping that they would see that and invest more ready-to-play resources into the offensive line, but they're betting on the development. And look, I think Butch Berry's a good offensive line coach. I think he's done good work with those guys, but I think that this team has not pushed its ceiling. The, the, the ceiling is the same. If it raises the floor, that's nice, but like there are limits on this team uh, on the offensive line. So I understand why that they're happy with the development that they saw last year. I am questionable that that development is going to be linear. I, I don't mm. know how much more improvement I see from those players. And that worries me given how they've addressed the offensive line this year. So would you be one of those people that would want to use some of our cap space on some more veteran interior line options? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't see a reason not to, right? Like I really don't like what you, what I think you, you need to add a safety and I think you should add another offensive line piece, right? Like what's the downside here? You signed yeah. Dalton Risner to a one year, $4 million contract. If he's bad, he's a flexible bench option for you. If he's good, he's better than Liam Eikenberg. Hell, you could and, sign him and Van Rotten left guard and right guard insurance policies for less than $8 million together, probably. Yeah, right. So, like, to me, there's no downside. Like, I, I don't really see the downside here. Like, this is, you know, you have the cap space opened up post-June 1. Use it, right? You got to save some for during the season. I'm not saying you you use all of it, but... Well, and to his extension is going to create more, too, right? It should, right? Ideally, right? In an ideal world. Um, and so to me, like, I don't see the downside of bringing in a guard. I really don't. Like, I like if he's bad, he's bad. Okay, you you, you had that money, right? Use it, you know? So mm. we'll see. But I, again, like, I think there's good guard options out there. Um, I don't see a reason not to sign one of those guys. I really yeah. don't. So let's get into the draft, and let's start off with the Dolphins sitting at 21. They passed on the likes of Graham Barton and to the dismay of many fr- uh, fans, Jackson Powers Johnson. They went with Chop Robinson. Omar Kelly's on record as saying he talked to an AFC executive and they had a number 12 ranking on their big board for Chop Robinson. I believe the Dolphins had a top 15, top 18 ranking on him. Uh, what are your thoughts on this pick at 21? We obviously know this is like an Amarius Mims situation. Crazy high ceiling. 
but he needs to be coached up and developed developed specifically with his hands and technique and such. Where, where, where are you at with this pick? Yeah, so I think um, I was already of the framework that there was a 0% chance the Dolphins were going to draft an interior lineman at 21. Yeah. Um, I did not think they were going to take Jackson Powers Johnson. I didn't think they were going to take Graham Barton. Um, this team does not value interior offensive line. They don't. Uh, and whether that's good or bad is we could have, I could do a whole show on that because clearly I don't agree with them, but that's where they're at. Right. So I was not expecting those players. I think the dolphins just got a little bit unlucky with how the board fell. Troy uh, Fatanu comes off the board right in front of them. The Marius Mims comes off the board right in front of them. You have um, the Vikings trade up for Dallas Turner. He comes off the board. Jared verse comes off the board. Byron Murphy's off the board at 16 to Seattle. Um, the other edge right Latu was off the board 15 to Indianapolis. So yeah. at the end of the day, all the top tackles are gone. All the top edge rushers are gone. So honestly, like in the moment, I was pretty surprised when they read chops or chop Robinson's name. I was like, Oh, not a name that I was expecting. Uh, but when you go back and look at who was on the board, I actually think it makes a ton of sense just because, Hey, they probably had edge and tackle up there as these are premium positions. We care about these positions. We'll take the best player on our board. Who's still there at 21. Uh, and you know what? The top tackles were gone and the top edges were gone. So they went to that next group and that next group was chopped. Now to answer your question about where he probably stacked the, you have to understand again, and this is why I like taking the national POV a lot. Like uh, teams love chop Robinson players. Uh, these mm-hmm. really bendy, explosive um, high upside edge players. There's always a chop Robinson type who goes in round one every year. Now, Penn State just pumps these dudes out like crazy. I mean, they got one of these guys every year. Adafi Owe was the same way. Really explosive, bendy. Now, Owe had longer arms, a bit uh, better of an all-around type player, but Chops, I think, was a little bit more explosive in a straight line, if I recall correctly. So you have some trade-offs there, but generally speaking, they're roughly the same player. Owe was a late first-round pick to the Ravens. Uh, You see guys like this every year. Teams reach on these players. They take a shot on these guys. Sometimes they turn out, sometimes they don't. Um, but I think given what the Dolphins were working with at 21, um, I think it's a good pick. I, I do. I like, I've, I've talked myself into that one more and more. I think you go back and you watch Chop and, you know, I had a high grade on Chop. I had a really high two on him. Uh, he was like, uh, he was like a fringe top 25 player for me. So they get him at 21. Like I like the value. So um, I like Chop. I, I think there's a lot of potential there. I like him working with Anthony Weaver. I like him being in the same room as Bradley Chubb and Jalen Phillips. Um, I just would not expect him to play a lot this season. Uh, he's not a player that I think you should count on if you're trying to make the playoffs uh, in year one. And unfortunately, the Dolphins might have to count on him for more than they they bargained for. But we'll see. Sometimes you throw guys in and it, they sink or swim and they swim, right? And and they yeah. just they grow a lot faster than you're expecting. So. I like Chop. I think at 21, look, I was never – they were never going to take Jackson Power Johnson or Graham Barton. They just – they weren't going to do it. Uh, and Dolphins fans need to get used to the, why this brain trust – while this brain trust is here, they are not going to value those interior spots. They're just not. They don't care. Uh, and that goes for a lot of the Shanahan disciples across the league. You see that pretty consistently. Um, they, they weren't going to draft those guys. So I like Chop. I think the pick makes sense. Um, sticking with 21 – given the fact that they pivoted to Odell Beckham Jr. right after everything ended in terms of the draft, within a week of the draft ending, are you shocked that they didn't jump at Brian Thomas Jr. while he was on the board? No, not really. Um, I I don't think that they – my guess is they probably would have taken if one of like the top three guys fell, but I think the shot of that was (laughs) negligible at best, right? So – um, I don't think that they view wide receiver as a premium position, given that they have Jalen Waddle and Tyree Hill. I think that thing, you know, if they were gifted one, they would have taken it. But I think probably it was a combination of, hey, we have two elite receivers already. We know we're going to get Odell Beckham Jr. We can get Odell Beckham Jr. on an affordable deal. Um, we'll address this position later in the draft. It's a deep class. They clearly had other players that they liked that they took later. Um, so I, it didn't shock me. I would like to think that they consider Brian Thomas Jr., but I think reading the tea leaves, they just probably didn't. And that, that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, if they had taken him, it would have been great. I would have been very happy with the pick. I really like Brian Thomas Jr. Um, and I think his fit in Miami specifically would have been really nice, but I, I understand why they didn't go that direction. Were you shocked to hear that they're trying to trade back up into the first round? Yes, because I don't know who they were trying to get up. Um, so I, I've theorized it's Xavier Leggett because – 
heard rumblings that were trying to move into spot 30. Niels theorized Tyler Guyton. Maybe. I, I, I So uh, Michael Leva and I had this conversation on Dolphins Talk as well. We did a show like right after the draft. We, we kind of came to the same conclusion that you guys did, right? It's probably wide receiver or tackle, right? Like who else are they going to get up for? Like Worthy's an interesting one because – He was gone um, though, right? If so, they were trying to get to 30, he was already gone. Yeah, if they were trying to get to 30, he was already gone. But if I remember correctly, Greer had mentioned that the price was too steep to get back up. And that yeah. tells me like they didn't want to match the price of another team. And the only other trade in the back end of the first round was Kansas City and Buffalo. So like well, I have no, no sources. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. What was the other one? Carolina moved up. Oh, for Leggett. They flipped one spot. That that came together. What really. happened when we were trying to get Tristan Wirfs? It forced that's, the Tampa Bay Bucks to very, flip up one spot. That's that's a lot different though, because we were closer to that. Going from fifty five to thirty two is a lot different than wherever we were going up to get worse. Uh, no, right? no, no, we were at eighteen. No, 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 we were yeah eighteen to fourteen. We were going eighteen to fourteen. Yeah, so that that provides a lot more pressure, right? Like I don't know that. Like, I don't know if Carolina hears that because a bunch of receivers came off the board right after that, right? Like, was Carolina just that? Well, into what like happened? That? No, I think what it's, it's Purcell. Purcell. When, when Purcell went to San Fran, everyone was like, whoa, what's happening here? And then why are you moving up one spot? You can just sit there and wait for your guy. I, I thought it was a weird trade. I don't know. That tells I do th- me, the, moving up one spot tells me someone was sniffing around. That's what Maybe. that tells me. I do think it was receiver. Like I, I think it like I don't know what other guy they'd be going up to get. I Guyton, I guess, makes sense because he's kind of in the same like prototype as Patrick Paul, who they took at 55, but I don't know. I, I like the receiver theory. I think that makes a lot more sense given how many Either of those way, guys going came up. 23 off the board. spots or 25 spots is gonna be expensive. I wouldn't have done it. I'm I'm I yeah, I have a lot of problems with what they ended up doing. Well, don't you find it interesting? All but... of a sudden, on day two, we heard no rumblings of them trying to trade up to the top of day two. So that tells you whoever it was was gone by the end of round round one, right? And they had probably, no interest. probably. So at least they didn't trade up for Keon Coleman. That's all I gotta say, bro. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. Um, yeah. what are your thoughts on Patrick Paul? Now we know he's got the length. You know, um, you know, I, I think he's got quick feet. I just think the footwork is clunky, and that's why, yeah. you know, he, it can look like he's a little slow at times. You know, a couple of times he gets into that second level, gets there in a flash, but the guy doesn't find work, and you're like, what the heck is this guy doing at the second level? Um, it was littered all over the tape. Eh, he loves getting that arm across across the neck and getting away with a hold. He's an absolute master at it. Um, hey, and that translates if you can master it. Um, what are your thoughts on him? Because you look at the length, you look at the power, you know, which he relies on way too much sometimes instead of technique and that costs him. You look at the size, you look at the power, you look at the way he moves for a man that size. Um, what are your thoughts on this pick? Because I had Kingsley Sua Matea still on the board, rated higher. I had Roger Rosengarten still on the board, rated higher. And, you know, hey, McDaniel would go up more intel on this guy, so I'll, I'll concede to them. I had Kieran Amagaji rating rated a little higher, and he they all three of those guys were on the board still, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. And they went with Patrick Paul, who was my OT twelve. So what it felt like Austin Jackson all over again. Austin Jackson's like OT ten or eleven <laughs> when they drafted him. So yeah. what what? But I will say this: he's got the functional strength Austin Jackson never had. He's got the length that Austin Jackson didn't have. Um, what, 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 what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So um, I mentioned earlier that I've talked myself into the chop Robinson pick successfully. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to talk myself into Patrick Paul, and I'm going to be honest, I didn't get there. Not even a little like I, I so for frame of reference, I had a fifth round grade on Patrick Paul. Um, I did not. I don't think his tape is good. Like, period. I, I don't like he is big. That's where it stops for me. Like, I, I like I, I'm sorry. I don't see um his technique. It's weird, really right? He he, you, 
you got so much power, but you let guys uh, under in, in into your chest and he, they put you on your heels sometimes. It's weird. You know? Yeah, he um he has some of the worst handwork of an offensive tackle I've scouted in a long time. Um, for reference, I had a third round grade on Austin Jackson. Um, and that was a pick that I greatly would have on Sue Matea. Uh a high three. I probably had him on Austin J. Uh a high four. And I had Amadaji in the high three range. So I had all those guys. Patrick Paul was my lowest rated offensive tackle uh, that I did this year. Now I only watched 150 players. Um, so he was probably like my OT, like 11 or 12 as well. So we're right there. There you go. Yeah. Um, I, I'll sum up my problems with Patrick Paul because I don't want to be too negative. And I've talked at length at this and I've written articles about this. So my opinion's out there. You can go look, you know, if you really want like an in-depth one. Um my problem with Patrick Paul is this is a player who's played over 3000 collegiate snaps. Uh, and it looks like he has not gotten better in four years. Um, this is a player that I've seen play in person. I covered the American athletic conference when I was in college. I've seen Patrick Paul in person. I remember what he looked like when he started playing football uh, and the problems that he had in his technique have not gotten any better across four years of starting. Um, and that worries me because I think a lot of people look at him in a similar vein to, to Chop Robinson, right? Where they just say, oh, we have this player who hasn't figured it out yet and our coaches are going to teach him. And yeah, Patrick Paul hasn't figured it out yet and your coaches are going to have to teach him. But there's a difference, right? Because when I look at Chop Robinson, I see a player who's played a thousand collegiate snaps and has elite traits. Um, this is a player who's not very good at football right now, the technical side of football right now, because he hasn't played a lot of football. And that's understandable. I don't have any excuses for why Patrick Paul is still a huge project. This is a player that's going to turn 24 years old soon. He's not going to play this year. I, in an ideal scenario, I don't even think he's better than Kendall Lamb. I don't even think he's the backup swing tackle out of camp. Mm. Um, so he's probably not going to play this year unless something really bad happens up front, which, you know, knowing the Dolphins probably will. Um, so I, I don't know how many snaps he's going to get this year. He's going to sit, which is good. I think he should sit. And I think you like him working with Teron Armstead. I think you like the idea that, hey, the Dolphins are going to get the ball out so quickly. It doesn't matter if he can't land his punch inside the chest plate because the ball is going to be out and he's just big and that's going to be a problem for teams. So like that works and I understand it. My concern is that I don't, I have, I, I don't know what he brings to the table that you couldn't have gotten with the other players that we mentioned. One, two, like, again, this is where I start to get worried about them being a little bit arrogant because Chop hasn't played a lot of snaps. Paul's played a lot of snaps. Like I know everybody says like, oh, college coaching, college coaching is a lot worse than NFL coaching. And I don't necessarily agree with that. <laughs> like, mm. I think people really overestimate that one. And two, I think people underestimate how hard it is to jump from college to the NFL, right? Like the gap between, having to jump from college to the NFL is a lot bigger than the gap between college coaching and NFL coaching. And there's only so much you can make up. And Patrick Paul's technique is a mess. You have to redo the feet. You have to redo the hands. You have to redo his timing. You have to redo the angles he takes as a run blocker. And you have to figure out a way to get him leveraged. Now he's never going to be a well leveraged player because he's so big. You're always going to sacrifice that, but he's way too top heavy, man. There are, there are guys who are way weaker than him throwing him to the ground uh, on tape. And, and that happens in the NFL level. You're going to get killed. Um, and so I hope they can work with him because look, as, as negative as I'm being, there is a starting left tackle in there somewhere, right? Like in his profile, there is a version of history where he becomes a starting left tackle and God knows the Dolphins need one of those long-term and getting one for that money at pick 55 is really good. My worry is that this is going to take two years for him to be good. And by the time he's uh, good, he's going to be 25 years old and he's going to be eligible for an extension. He doesn't have the fifth year option as a second round pick. How good is he going to be at that point? Do you want to pay him at that point? Um, it, what if it takes longer, right? Like it took Austin Jackson four years to become a functional NFL tackle. If it takes Patrick Paul the same amount of time, he's going to be like 28 when he mm. gets on the field and is good. Um, this is not a player that like has a long development track. He's old and he's already played a lot of football. With the window with Chop Robinson, if you get four years of Chop Robinson, he's 24, 25. That's not great, but it's not bad. 
Patrick Paul's going to be almost 30. Now, obviously, I don't think it's going to take four years for either of those guys. I'm just saying, like, the Dolphins have drafting a player to develop. You have a window, right? And the window with Patrick Paul is shorter. He doesn't have the fifth-year option, and he's older. And I haven't seen him get better in four years. I, like, that's what worries me. Like, there is no development on this man's tape, and he's played 3,000 snaps. I don't know. So I, I'm just, I can't get into the Patrick Paul tape. I tried. Um, I hope it works when, out. When, when, when do you wrong. start? Listen, and I, I agree with what you're saying. So this is just a general question. When do you start putting it on the school itself? So I look, I'm not saying that the school doesn't have any bearing here, right? Like I, I'm not saying that Houston has like the greatest offensive line coach of all time or anything like that. My point is that like, players who improve typically improve right like in general um and like honestly like you can see improvements on chops film right and i think penn state's coaching is fine i i don't think james franklin's a good in-game decision maker but he's clearly capable of recruiting and developing talent um i think though at a certain point like when you have the same problem for four years i don't care like who the coach in the room is there's no way the houston offensive line coach was watching Houston tape and he wasn't like, dude, you got to fix your hand placement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, like I'm a nobody. I'm not offensive line guru. I'm, I'm a nobody. And I can watch his tape and be like, this man's going to get called for holding every other snap at the NFL level. They don't call holding yeah, yeah, like yeah. they do in college. It's and like, littered everywhere. It's yeah. it's every rep, every rep could yeah. be holding at the NFL right. level because he's outside the hands, right? Like a lot yeah. of people, Oh, you don't see the Jersey tug. Dude, NFL players are going to induce the the jersey tug more than you know the six foot two, two hundred and thirty five pound edge rusher from Tulane or whatever, right? Like it, it's so. When do you put it on the school? Like, look, Patrick Paul can get better with Miami. I just like he has to get a lot better. It's not like oh he needs like a couple of tweaks. This is a player you have to completely redo everything with him. You you are starting from the bottom in my opinion, at least, with Patrick Paul. And so you, you think this is even worse than Josh there. Jones? You think this is even worse than Josh Jones coming out? I had out? a third-round grade on Josh Jones. Yeah, and we've yeah. seen he hasn't really exactly worked out, right? He's okay. He's bouncing like, he's around, right? fine, right? Like, he's yeah, a yeah. he's an yeah, NFL yeah. player. I mean. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, like, right? but but he was a third-round pick. If they had taken yeah. Patrick Paul... 17 like, picks after he won 72. Yeah, like, if they had taken Patrick Paul, like... I don't know if they traded back into the fourth round for him or traded back into the third round for him. I think I'd be less upset because I think at 55, I think they passed on a lot of really good players. Like just yeah. overall, like at a lot of positions, not just tackle. Uh, I think you could have got a really nice safety there. I think there were still wide receivers on the board that you could have taken that I think were fine. Um, there are better offensive tackles. I think at 55, I would have considered uh, that's where off interior. interior offensive line enters yeah. the, the conversation for me. Yeah, um, okay. So that's my worry with Paul. I think that's probably the only pick that they made where I was just like, I, I'm not going to get there. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but so you got there on McMorris, eh? I mean, for what he is, sure. Yeah. I mean, he's a six round pick, dude. He can play special <laughs> teams. Sure. Why not? You know, I mean, like, they take a Patrick Paul in the sixth round. I would have been fine. I would have been like, yeah, he's big. <laughs> sure. You know? So I got to ask you, what was the vibe in the Colinelli household when they traded up for a running back? Okay, so <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, I'll be honest. I saw the trade terms and my head exploded because – who? Okay, first of all, who would you think they were trading up for before they announced Jalen Wright? I had no idea. I, okay. I really didn't because, like, I, I when I heard they were trading up, I was like, what are they doing? I was like, who are they taking here, man? Like – um, so I honestly had no idea. It, it surprised me all the way around. And then I got the notification that they sent a future third to get back up in the fourth. And then they took Jalen Wright, And I was like, ah, oh, dude, this sucks. This is bad. But then I kind of thought, I was like, all right, look, they have comp picks next year. It's fine. Jalen Wright. I like Jalen Wright. Um, yeah. so I have a sub stack casual draft analyst every year. I released the all Hollywood team, which is just a list of my favorite players, regardless of where I have them ranked, regardless of Same. how yeah, good I think they're going to be. Yeah. Jalen Wright was my running back on this year's team, yeah. right? So, like, yeah. oh, I really like Jalen Wright, too. I think he's a good, yeah. really good I. football player. He was on my man crush list, too. There we go, right? Great mind. So, um, yeah. 
after I got over the initial like, oh my god, they just moved up for They're a running back, bro. I, yeah. Bro, I, I hope I hope your loved ones had a defibrillator on site because <laughs> I thought about you when that went through. I'm like, this guy's probably having a heart attack. Yeah. So once I got over it, I, it actually ends up being like one of my favorite picks that they made <laughs> across three you days. Know, right? Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. And obviously, look, he's fast, right? Like we, we can gloss over the speed. He's a perfect scheme fit, blah, blah, blah. He's really fast, sure. Um, I think it makes sense in like the, you probably don't think Raheem Mostert's going to be back next year and you're just, you want two backs, right? And will so he be healthy in December, bro? Yeah, and you don't know that either, right? So you want two backs and you know what? Devon A-Chain has injury concerns as well. Um, but I think in an ideal world, right? You move on from Mozart after next season and it's right in A-Chain and you keep chugging and, Look, if Jalen Wright's an RB2 who rushes for, I don't know, we'll we'll call it 800 yards a year on average, right, throughout his career, it's a great pick in the fourth round. I have no problem with that. Uh, and assuming that they're going to get two comp picks for Robert Hunt and Christian Williams, in the, or Christian Wilkins, sorry, in the third round, like, I have no problem with that. Now, look, is the value great? No, probably not. But I understand it. It's fine. I can live with it. Um, I really like Jalen Wright. I wrote about this for uh si dolphins i think he was the best pass protecting back in the entire yeah. class yeah. um and that's probably the most appealing thing about his film to me because i'm a scout uh don't you get jonathan taylor vibes though with people doubting him as a receiver just because he wasn't asked to do it a lot um yeah i mean i think he's functional like i think he can catch screens i don't want him out there running routes but i i, I think he can catch screens for you and he can catch um you know, he can do like swing passes, all the crazy yeah. like backhand flip stuff the Dolphins like to do behind the line, right? Like, I think he can do all of that. He can catch jet sweeps for you. I don't want him out there running slants or, you no, know, running no, no. seam routes or nothing. Yeah, but yeah. Um, no, I think I think he's functional catching the football. But I think you have to ask yourself, like, is he better than A-Chain? And is he better no. than Mostert? But you and can I don't... line all three of those on the field. And now what? Okay, so like, sure, that would be funny, right? But then, who are you taking off the field, bro? I'm just running an old T T T. You're formation, running the T bone. Ah, okay, all right. <laughs> there you go. Solve. We solved the fourth and one problem. Just just run the wishbone with three or uh, thirty one personnel on the field. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, and it also came out right that they moved up because they're trying to get ahead of the Dallas Cowboys because that the uh, Cowboys were eyeing them or whatever too. So, um. All right, let's stick with day two. Mo Kamara, mm. that pick. Uh, sorry, day three. Sorry, I apologize. Um, the Mo Kamara pick. Um, what are your thoughts on Mo Kamara? Um, do you see a guy who gets in the rotation this year? So, um, yeah, I, I think he could. I think uh, the problem with Miami's edge room right now is that I would tell you that Shaq Barrett, Chop Robinson, and Mo Kamara effectively serve the same purpose currently. To me, those are three pass rush specialists. Uh, mm -hmm. I have no desire to see any of those three players defend the run. Shaq Barrett is like fine, um, but I think ideally at this point in his career, he's a designated pass rusher. Um, but those are the only three healthy edge players that weren't UDFAs. Um, so they're probably going to have to see the field. Uh, depending on what the the timeline looks like for Jalen Phillips and Bradley Chubb. Uh, so I think Will Kamara gets into the rotation. I think, though, he's a designated pass rusher long-term. Um, he's just not good enough to hold up against the run. He's too small. Like, he's smaller. Than, he's tiny. Like, there's a difference mm. between small and tiny. He's tiny. Um, but his tape is great. His tape's a ton of fun, man. Like, this is the exact opposite of Chop Robinson, right? Like, Chop, you're betting on the traits. You're betting on the growth. The film is like, eh. But Mo is like, the film's great and everything else is maybe not what you want. He's explosive. I'll give him that. Like, he's not a bad athlete or anything like that. I think he's a good straight line athlete. Um, you really like the pass rush moves, the way he uses his hands. He can corner a lot better than I was expecting. Like, he, he can dip a little bit. He can dip a rip a little bit. Um, that's the type mm. of pass rusher I really gravitate toward. Um, so, I really like Mo Kamara. I didn't watch him pre-draft. Uh, I ended up re-watching him uh, for the article that I wrote for SI Dolphins. I would have had, like, a probably a high floor on him. So the Dolphins getting him in the fifth is a okay with me. I think he can be a player who, I don't know, gets you four to five sacks a year as a designated pass rusher. And with a fifth round pick, like sign me the hell up. Like that's a great pick in the fifth round. Anybody who contributes at that level. Um, and I, so I really like Mo Kamara, man. I, a ton of fun, really, really cool player. I hope he works out because I think in an ideal world, you get Jalen Phillips and Brad and uh, 
Chop Robinson as your long-term starting edges and you kind of work guys in. And I think Mo working into that rotation is really nice. Mm. Um, now, your th- your thoughts on the last two picks there, Patrick McMorris and Tajay Washington. Uh, you think either one has a real legitimate chance to make the 53? Uh, so Tajay Washington, he he's going to have to do it on kickoffs. Seventh round pick at a USC. He's... He, I don't think he's a good enough receiver to make the 53. Like he's going to have to come out of camp as like the kickoff guy or the punt yeah. guy. Um, and I don't really see a world where he is better than Braxton Berrios. I know some Dolphins fans will feel differently and that's fine. I think Berrios is a perfectly fine returner. I don't really see uh, any reason to change that unless Washington like really just returns a couple of kicks in the preseason for touchdowns or something. Like, I don't know. Um, so that one would be a surprise. McMorris, I think, could get to the 53 just because he's the third safety right now. Like it, Now, obviously, you'd like to think that they sign a safety. I'd like to see them bring in a Justin Simmons or somebody like that. I don't know that they're going to do that. I'd actually be pretty surprised. I hope they do, but I, I, I don't think that they will. Um, he's the third safety right now. Uh, so you kind of need him on the 53, quite frankly. Um, and so... The thing with McMorris is I think uh, if you watch it. disrespect to Elijah Campbell, bro. They haven't listed a DB. I'm joking. You know? So, like, I don't know, man. (laughs) I don't know. Like, you go to the roster right now. There's three safeties on the roster. You shift him to safety because you've seen them toying with it the last couple years? I think you probably have to just from, like, need, right? But even then, like, I think you probably keep four safeties, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, like, even then, McMorris still sticks. Um, And so – I, I watched his Cal tape and I got through like one game and I wasn't a fan. So I went back and watched his San Diego state tape from two years ago and it was a lot better. Um, and so I think you're hoping you get that player. The biggest problem with McMorris is he can't tackle. Like he, he just, he cannot tackle. He is a wildly um, inefficient, over aggressive tackler. When he lands, it's great. He has a lot of impact when he hits his target, but he just gives up way too many broken tackles. He misses way too many tackles. Uh, if you could get that under control, I think he could be a special teams piece for you, though, which is fine mm. as a six round pick. I have no problem with that at all. I know you haven't watched them all, but especially heading into rookie mini camp, which UDFAs interest you the most? Like, for example, you know, I know you've watched Grayson Murphy as of I. Um, like, are you as interested in me and in seeing guys like, you know, I've watched the film, but like, Mark Perry or like Jordan Colbert, like we were just talking about safety and how there's such a need there. Which of these UDFA of these UDFAs kind of interest you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I like Grayson Murphy. I had a draftable grade on him coming out of UCLA. I think he's uh, in a similar vein to Mo Kamara. I think he's got good technique. I think you're betting on him outsmarting his opponent rather than out athleting them. And I think that can be valuable. So I kind of see him very similarly to Mo Kamara. I had similar grades on them. Frankly, I had Mo Kamara a little bit ahead of Grayson Murphy. And I really liked his brother, uh, Gabriel. But Gabriel. I, I had that. similar gains, uh, similar grades, sorry. Um, I don't really have an opinion on Jordan Colbert just because I haven't watched him. So I'll defer to you. I trust you. Um I do like uh, Storm Duck a little bit from Louisville. I think he's got some juice. Um, I remember watching him play as a freshman. I went to cover the Independence Bowl when he was at North Carolina. They played Temple, and he he had a a couple nice plays in that game. I think he's a good athlete. Um, I think he can maybe even transition to safety. You might like him a little bit better there. I think that's an interesting conversation. So those are the two guys that stick out to me. Um, I think like just looking at this group, like from a positional POV, I think Jordan Colbert's really interesting because he is a safety. And then obviously Mark Perry as well from TCU. Um, I'd be interested to see like what uh, Andrew Meyer from UTEP looks like just because he's a pure center. Uh, And I I wonder how appealing that would be to the Dolphins as like a one for one replacement where they don't have to like mess around with so many guys. Right. Because if Liam, if Liam Eikenberg's your starting guard, you can't then put him at center right in certain yeah. stances unless you like i don't know it could be interesting uh udfa guys are tough because um there's always a very good reason that the, that they're udfa there's there's never no reason um and so but i think the safeties are interesting just because there's no depth there right like like we talked about they're gonna have to move elijah campbell maybe patrick mcmorris makes the team when he probably should just because they need bodies at that spot 
outside of chop and we're gonna go back and talk about this guy who's one rookie you would tell miami dolphin fans to keep an eye on and this is why i haven't asked you about him yet because <laughs> besides chop the rookie i would say is malik washington i think yeah. this kid's gonna ball bro i think this might he, there's a chance he might have been their best pick. You know, I, I agree with you with the Jalen Wright. The Jalen Wright to me, when you talk about value and talent, I think Jalen Wright's probably that pick. But Malik Washington to me is vying for that pick. Who's the one person you would tell, one rookie you would tell fans to keep an eye on at minicamp? Would it be a guy like Malik, Malik Washington? Yeah, that would be the name. And uh, when I wrote him up, I put at the end, I said, don't be surprised if this is the most productive rookie that the Dolphins get out of this class in 2024. Because mm. I think when you watch his tape, um, it is so easy to draw the line from what he did at Virginia, from what he's going to be asked to do in Miami. And I think I tweeted this out. like There are plays in Virginia's offense that are ripped right out of Mike McDaniel's playbook. right? Yeah. Because you'll see Malik Washington line up at H-back and do the wheel yeah. route thing. And, and uh, like I, I don't like Mike McDaniel basically invented that this past year. Now it's not quite the same. They don't start him in motion before the snap, but it's the same concept. They're hiding him from press and from coverage, and they're giving him a roughly speaking a running start parallel to the line and up the field. And um, and so you see a lot of the the jet sweep stuff out of those looks. You see a lot of the quick hitters, right? The quick spot routes, sitting down against zone coverage, catching a quick pass. You see the um, the screens, right? You see the manufactured touches. Uh, you see the slant routes, right? Like the, the, the quick stuff the Dolphins like to do to get the ball uh, added to his hands quickly. So you see a, a player in Malik Washington who is running the exact routes that I think the Dolphins are going to ask him to run at Virginia. Now, the thing with Washington and the reason he's a fifth round pick is, yes, he's small. But it's also because like he's a one trick pony. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Like that's just that's what you're getting with guys late in the draft. But what would you rather take Malik in? In the fifth round, or what Xavier Worthy at twenty eight? I'd probably, I'd probably rather take Malik Washington, which sounds insane. Um, but look, I think Xavier Worthy is a better player. I just, I was not going to be the person to draft Xavier Worthy. I just, yeah. I was not like it was not going to be me. If he works out, it's probably going to be in Kansas. Is it Malik like one ninety one or one ninety four? <sighs> yeah, he's something like that. I'll look it up. But I, I think like, look, I think Malik can be a starting slot. In the NFL. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Right. So, like that role for me in the fifth round, like, hell yeah. You know, <laughs> like sign yeah. me up. That's awesome. Um, and I think specifically for the Dolphins, like, there is nobody better at getting the most out of these types of players than the Dolphins. So he's Malik was 191, five, eight yeah, and a half, yeah. third percentile. It's got like and 26. Then- it's 26 pounds on worthy, right? Yep. 191, 25th percentile. I'll look up worthy just for the sake of accuracy. I think and worthy pounds. was 165, which is first percentile. So yeah, pretty, pretty big difference. Um, and so I, I think the Malik picks a home run, even if he does nothing, I still think it's a home run um, just because I think he provides depth for you. I think he can be a, a punt returner. I think he could be a kickoff returner. Um, the question that you have to ask yourself with Malik and his ceiling is going to be predicated on how much you can expand his route tree to resemble something of a traditional slot rather than like a mm. manufactured touch slot. This is not yeah. a player. I think a lot of people like, right? Like they see these like aggregator accounts post these clips of him chopping his feet and running these routes. Uh, Malik runs like three routes on Virginia tape um, and he's good at them. He is good at them. I, I'm not saying he's not, but there, there's three. It's a slant. It's a go, and it's the out and up, which they God they killed teams with that double move. <laughs> Virginia, he scored like four touchdowns off that. It was great, um, and I hope the Dolphins use it. But he's got like three routes, uh, and so how much you can expand his tree is going to be like, hey, maybe when Tyree Kill leaves, they don't have to go get another player because Malik Washington has gotten so much better that you feel good about him and Jalen Waddle and uh, a second tier guy. Right. So that's where I, I, I kind of think about Malik Washington long term. Short term, uh, I, I think you're, he's a great fit. I think he can get on the field. I think he can produce for you. The question with the, the Dolphins, which is really interesting, like conceptually, they have so many guys who are great with the ball in their hands, but there's a, still only one football. It's a great problem to have. But like, I would rat, like, where does Malik Washington rank on the pecking order 
of touches. You know what I mean? Because like for me, he's behind Tyreek. He's behind Jalen. I'd put him behind John U. Smith. I would put him behind all three of the top running backs. I'd probably put him behind Odell Beckham Jr. too. So he's like, what, eight? Mm. Right? In year one, right? Like, And again, like, but maybe he just comes out there and he's the slot on, on starting wide receiver sets. And you know what? They really like him. And he he jumps ahead of um, A-Chain and he jumps ahead of Wright and he jumps ahead of Smith. Like, I think there's a version of history where that happens. But this is a slam dunk pick for me. I really like Malik. I think he's going to have a nice mini camp. I think he's going to have a good training camp. I think he'll have a good preseason. Um, I think this probably spells the end for Eric Izukama and some of the other guys on the roster. Um, there's a really big, uh, there's going to be a roster crunch. How many receivers are you going to keep? Well, right? that's what I was going to ask you. Do you take seven? Like we used to do with Flores. <sighs> All right. So it, let, 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 let's, let's, let's spell it out here. We got Tyreek Hill. We got Jalen Waddle, obviously. Odell Beckham yeah. Jr. is making the team. That's three. Yeah. I think Barrios Malik's makes making the team. The team. Mal- I think Barrios, I think Malik makes the team. That's five. So that's five. But the thing is, we got a lot of the same guys. See, that's the thing, right? And and that's a bigger problem that I have with the team in general. I think they've they've over-indexed on prototypes because all the running backs are exactly the same, roughly speaking. As runners, they're exactly the same. Um, yeah. As receivers... The only different receiver in the room is Izukama, so Izukama. I'd actually, yeah. I'd actually keep him. I don't think yeah. they will. So would a guy like Craycraft be the one that would be? Yeah, I think Craycraft. Team? I think Craycraft makes the team over Izukama as long as he doesn't completely choke in the preseason. Because he, because Craycraft's been ahead of Izukama on the depth chart for years, for two years now. Why well, I don't, I don't see any reason why that changes, right? Unless Izukama like really like takes a jump, but Izukama had a solid preseason before, and it didn't matter. You know, yeah. like I. So I don't I don't think he makes the team, which is I I would keep him over one of the speed guys because I I still think they need somebody with with some size. Uh and I think he's the only guy who provides that. But I would not be surprised if it's like Craycraft and he doesn't make it. You know Barrios, you can get out of his money too, and he might be in trouble too with a guy like Malik, right? Um, I agree. Yeah, no, Barrios is like I'm like 70 30 on Barrios. Like I, I think he makes the team, but I, I don't think it. Like if they cut him, it wouldn't shock me either. So, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Um, man, it's gonna be uh interesting with with how that wide receiver room shakes out. Feels like we've said that like every year. Um, listen. I gotta ask you because we're about to get into the underwear Olympics. All right. <laughs> who do you think these who would you tell people to be cautious of potentially raving about in the you know the media raving about? Like a guy like what I mean is like, you know, Gavin Hardison from UTEP, right? <laughs> Everyone talks about how big his arm is and da 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 da. <laughs> and I could see the okie doke, right? Like I could see the media trying to sell the okie doke of, you know, Gavin Hardison's look great at mini camp, blah, 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 blah. When we all know when we get to seven on sevens and the pads come on, you're going to see exactly why he went undrafted. You know what I mean? Um, Mm -hmm. Do you think a player like Patrick Paul could be that where they just see how, you know, imposing he looks in shorts and all of a sudden people are raving about him. What, What do you think? Yeah, so I don't know if I have a specific player. Uh, I'll just kind of talk about like my general mindset with minicamp. Um, yeah. I take minicamp with a grain of salt. Mm-hmm. Uh, minicamp is not an evaluation tool that I think is particularly effective, um, mm-hmm. especially when you're on the outside looking in, right? Like I think for the coaches, minicamp serves the purpose of getting everybody on the same page, making sure people are in shape, right? It's, it's the start of the season. You're not like, even coaches are not going to go out there. And if a guy's a bad mini camp, they're going to be like, ah, oh, dude, this guy sucks. Like we're cooked. It's Hey, here's where we're at. Let's get together as a team. Let's do install, you know, let's get everybody up to speed, make sure people are in shape. It's not really, I work with a lot of NFL coaches now, which is a weird thing that I can say, former NFL coaches, Mini camp, on it, you stunned yeah, on these right. People. It's just super weird that I get to say that still, <laughs> even though it's been like two years. Um, I, I mini camp is more of a let's get everybody in the same building, let's get on the same page, let's start yeah. the journey off on the right foot. It is not like in either way, 
right? It's not a, hey, you shouldn't care if anybody does really good. You also shouldn't care if anybody does bad. If Tua throws a few picks in minicamp, you should – like, I, I don't, don't care. It. Don't I say don't it. Care. I don't care. I remember the torrential downpour. Was it? It wasn't even training camp. Remember, it was like mini camp. And the was that last downpour? year or the year before? No, was it was before. It was his last year. Remember? Oh, dude, that was insane. <laughs> it was so was, funny. Was where he threw like five interceptions. In yeah, camp dude. Whatever. Everybody oh, throws. Man. Everybody throws picks in camp. Um, everybody. Well, you remember looks... Patrick uh, Mahomes' first year as a starter before they went into the yeah, season? Yeah, he threw how like he had that... four picks, right, in one practice? No, he threw like seven in – yeah, yeah. And he threw like seven in like a weekend. And yep. we were like, oh, my God, Patrick Mahomes is trash. Yeah, you know like I, mean? I – uh, here's the general rule of thumb. This is, is where you can make the mistakes, man. Like, I'm going to be honest. Like On the, on the scale of how I value uh, preseason stuff – Number yeah. one for me is practice. Actually, it is training camp itself. Yeah, yeah. Then it's the preseason, and then mini camp is last. Overall, I don't think any of those things matter as much as we make them out to be in the moment because we're so starved for football content. Um, there is a version of history where the preseason doesn't exist in like a year. Yeah, I like Roger Goodell wants to cut it. I, I know he does. He said it publicly. Like I, I, they, they are continuously cutting games in the preseason. They will shorten it. I am telling you, and I am telling fans out there, it is so easy to get caught up in the preseason hype. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do it for fun purposes because it's football and it's fun and we all want to have a good time, but it is not a good evaluation tool. I would say it's much worse even than college tape. Yeah, because th- there are players playing in the pre the, the preseason is like so detached from what actual NFL football looks like. It's almost impossible to evaluate. You get a better gauge on guys practicing against other teams in like joint practices and their own practices. There's mm-hmm. there's more NFL head to head competition in those practices than there is on the preseason football field. So. Look, just enjoy mini camp. Enjoy the tidbits. Enjoy the folk heroes. But don't get too invested and don't go too far the other way either, right? Like if, if everybody's like, ah, the offense sucks in minicamp, they're garbage. Don't don't get too invested in that either. There's no reason for that. It, it's May. Right. Yeah, again, I agree 110 percent Um anything you want to add here before we get out of here? Um, the only thing I want to add is that I liked the Dolphins draft class. I feel like I always come off so negative. That's just the what'd you give it? A grade. Going. Grade. What was your grade? Uh, I think it's like a B. Like I, I like yeah, it. I, I think it's good. I like I understand the picks. I understand the vision. As I'm just, a, I'm, I'm a skeptic at heart, and I don't think I don't like Patrick Paul. Right? Like that's what it boils down to. Right? Like if they had taken uh, Kingsley Suamatea, it probably would have been like a B plus, A minus. Yeah. <laughs> like, so it didn't mean. Yeah. Like it, didn't it, the Chiefs get him? Didn't yep. the Chiefs get him? Yeah, dude. I dude, the Chiefs, the Chiefs make me the risk get richer, bro. They they make me oh. sick. Their their draft was so good. They they it drafted was. a bunch of very good football players. So the they make Steelers. me sick. Yeah, the, so Steelers the Steelers class makes two years in a row. The Steelers making me sick. Um, uh, yeah. So look, I like the Dolphins draft. I I came off really negative. It really just boils down to I don't like the Patrick Paul pick at fifty five, and that's where a lot of my misgivings are. I think all the other picks are incredibly reasonable. I think that there's a path to those players being successful. Um. And I think the Dolphins did the best they could, especially at 21, with the hand that they were dealt. Like, it wasn't a great hand. I didn't expect all three edges and all tackles to come off the board, especially with six quarterbacks taken in the top 12, right? Like, yeah. I just – I didn't think that was going to happen, and it did, and that's unfortunate, but chop's fine. So, I like the Dolphins draft. I like where this team's going. Very excited for the season, even though I sound like a crumbudgeon, you know, 50% worst, of the time. Wor- worst pick, Penix at 8 or Bo Nix at 12? Oh, oh boy! Eh? Oh man, this is. Tough, I gotta say, DJ. Bo Nix, bro. I, I so, Penix, I could get away with a top fifteen pick. Uh, Bo Nix for me. Dude, oh, you can't. I, I you can't talk me into either of these guys in the first round. I, I'm oh. sorry, and I like Penix. That, no, but now Broncos are doubling down and saying, "Oh, we put out these scouting reports to look like we're interested in these other people. We really, really I don't wanted Bo them. Nix." Yeah, I okay. don't believe. I, I believe that they liked Bo Nix, but I don't believe that he was their QB one. Stop. Yeah, no, enough. Yeah. The Sean Payton, uh, ridiculous. Yeah. I think uh, it's tough because I think Michael Penix is the better player, right, than Bo Nix. Like I had a higher grade on Michael Penix than I had on Bo Nix, but like. I don't know. Bo Nix is going to get on the field this year. Yeah. 
You know, he might just be like, okay, in year one, and Denver might win like nine games because that defense is very good still. And Bo Nix is suddenly playing in playoff games and Michael Penix is sitting on the bench with a cap. You know, like, yeah, yeah, like Atlanta's yeah. thought process here is just like really difficult to deal with. So I don't know. Yeah. I That pick was, oh, dude, what are, we, we've gone too far. <laughs> the quarterback value has has jumped the yeah. shark, man. We need to go back to the, the triple option. This is... It's making me hurt inside. Appreciate you for coming on, man. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. Anything you want to plug before we get out of here? Yeah. So as usual, I'll plug the 33rd team.com. We're going to be doing some really cool stuff uh, coming up for this year. So highly recommend checking us out. We cover the national POV, I think incredibly well. Um, we do some dolphin stuff from time to time because dolphins fans are so interactive. Um, so we, we will touch on the dolphins. A lot of people got mad at us because uh, AI predicted that the Dolphins would be bad. It was the AI, guys. It wasn't us. It was the AI. <laughs> Yell at Elon Musk. It was his AI. It was. We, we, asked, we asked the AI a question. The AI spot back that the Dolphins were going to finish in last place, which is absurd. But it wasn't us. It was the AI. Uh, so I, I highly recommend checking out 3013.com. Uh, and also, if you uh, feel inclined, subscribe to my Substack, the Casual Draft Analyst. Um, I'll be doing NFL draft work. I'm not starting on 2025 yet. I need a little bit of a break here. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into 2025 draft stuff probably in June. Um, and then also check out my work at SIDolphins.com and Fan Nation. I did a scouting report film review for every single Dolphins pick. I sat down and watched four games of Patrick McMorris for all of you. Um, and yeah, uh, yeah so that, that'll be my plugs. Um, really, really excited for the season. And thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure, bro. Uh, everyone, smash that like button. Subscribe if you're new. And we'll see y'all in the next one. Take it easy, everyone. Fins up. Go fins. Whatever floats your boat.